interesting. And that's when I started looking into microarchitecture. So I picked up on the thread that I dropped when the Intel engineers had told us to just use VTune. And I was like, no, no, there must be a way of understanding this. It's tractable, surely. Surely somebody has worked this out. And by this point, people had started seriously reverse engineering how Intel processors work. And that was an eye-opener for me. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they then published how they did it, and you could learn tricks and techniques for taking the chip inside your computer and like running experiments and going, well, this must be what this thing is then. Wow, I'd never really thought of that. And so that was a huge uh, moment in my life of like going, wow, we can understand this. We can rationalize it. We can even measure it. Some of the times with Intel's own tools that they don't really specify very well for obvious reasons. But right. yeah, exciting, exciting and, stuff. And so what what are some of those like resources? I, I want to talk uh, about the, the finance uh, world because I think that's uh, particularly uh, opaque, especially to folks on the outside, um, which there's there's probably that's probably going to impact maybe some of the things we can talk about. But uh, to some extent, I, yeah. But I mean, yeah, yeah. I've had I've had some exposure. Um, I went to university in in St. Louis, and um, and so we would go up to Chicago to the high frequency trading firms, and they'd have like these competitions where you it was basically like algorithmic trading competitions, and they'd do a simulation. Um, so I got a little bit of exposure, but I am interested to dive into that. But I would be remiss if I didn't dig in on you mentioned some of those resources um, right. that you've been able to use to kind of do some of that reverse engineering and experimentation. Uh, what what are some of those? Well, so the first one is the sort of the Bible by Agna Fogg, who is this sort of very uh, interesting person from a, some Nordic country. I think he's a professor of of, um, of something un- unusual. It's not actually computer science or anything like that. It's it's some some something else. But he's got a, a passionate interest in reverse engineering, and he's written these PDFs that are like fully take take parts of the the pipeline of all of the major revisions of of the Intel pipe uh, Intel mm. um, line of chips. You know, starting from the the earliest Pentium three all the way through to modern day Core two um, type processors. And you know, he explains everything that he's been able to work out in a very accessible way. And like, it's one of those things where I don't know if you have anything like this in your life where once a year I reread it anyway. Just though, even right. though I think I know it, there's stuff that I miss. And I've got, there's two or three books that fall into this category. I've got Bjarne Struestrup's like Tour of C++, which is a small book. But every time I read it, I go, oh, I don't think I knew you could do that. You know, it's a huge language, right? Um, another one is Agna Fogg's um, performance uh, manuals. Um, I think the third one, if you go to his website, which is delightfully 1990s era white website with the most disgusting background color and <laughs> animating gifs and things across the top you really honestly feel like you've fallen into a myspace from yeah the 90s or two, early 2000s right. and it's you know it's, 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 a, it's a choice right <laughs> that's, that's the thing that tells you who he is um so i'll read that and then there's also uh charles petzold's um annotated mm. turing which is uh, a fad, fantastic book of just you know like learning where this whole thing started and how it came out of one person well obviously lots of people have contributed over the years but like there's such a defining st- story of uh how computers came to be in a very abstract way you know that's about as abstract as you can possibly get with an actual turing machine and it's infinite piece of tape and you're like well that's very different actually uh <laughs> right right um, but um yeah so the resources that he gets first of all you know he's 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 done the research and he's got the receipts and he can show you the receipts but he's also written a quite a very accessible um prose around how all these things fit together what the various stages are uh, how long things take in general what the various execution ports are on the x86 how many there are what types of instructions go to which ports um, how retirement happens how the register files accessed how there's the, and, and a lot of this stuff comes because like Intel want to be able to tell you where the bottleneck is in your code. They won't tell you exactly what's going on, but there's probably a counter somewhere with a name in the manual which just says reg file stall or something like that with like number of registers file stalls. And that's all it'll say. And then you can go, well, uh, let's write an experiment. How many instructions can I queue up to access different registers that haven't been re- renamed, which is another thing. Right? So I'm going to thousands of knobs beforehand so that everything's out of the rename buffer. Okay, let's try these things and go, oh, I can do four. I can do five. Oh, six, it stalls. Okay, and this counter started going up. That kind of feel right and so he right. he he has an open source project as well which you can go and fiddle with and you know you 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 can use to set up and tweak little experimental pieces of code 
and so that's that's one of the main resources and yeah again that's something you re- you can reread over and over again and then and always learn something new uh, similarly, there's um, I don't know the folks behind it, but the uops.info is a website that has essentially all the XML or JSON or YAML or whatever description of every single instruction that there ever is or was for every single architecture they could possibly run the code on. And then you get like, well, this is how many cycles delay it is. This is the reciprocal throughput. This is all these other things. These are which ports we observed it going through. So this goes through ports 0, 1, and 2, but not 3 or 4, or those kinds of things. And then they have um, some of their own code as well, which um, at some point I will integrate into a website uh, to, to make it available to all um, that does a very good job of like a Python-based simulator of all of this stuff. And they've kind of done a – there's a paper out somewhere that describes the process by which they went through the process by which they went through to get to the, the sort of almost one-to-one mapping with the real hardware, which I thought was totally impossible. You know, like here I am sweating over getting a 1980s era computer with uh, like very, very simple to be perfectly in sync with uh, the reality. And then they're like, no, we can write a Python program that can simulate this hun- tens of billion transistor monstrosities that we build these days. Right. <laughs> So those are some of the resources. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I my own tiny, tiny, tiny contribution to this was trying to reverse engineer how the branch predictor uh, worked under some circumstances. One of those things where like, I thought I'd read this thing on the forum over and over again. Oh, yeah, the, the branch prediction, blah, blah, blah. It always assumes that branches backwards are true because uh, they're presumably a loop and branches right. forwards are false. And when I like, got it in my head, I'm like, well, the thing is, it doesn't even know that there's a branch there until it's decoded the branch, which is actually five or six pipeline stages from the fetch. And so it's already too late at that point. So there's all these various different, well, you know, if there's a branch here. Um, And if it's a conditional branch, you've already done all this work. Maybe you should just let it fall through, Mm -hmm. right? Also, how do you know if you've seen this conditional branch before or not? Because most branch prediction algorithms these days use some kind of hashing function that kind of hashes the branch, the pattern, the phase of the moon, yesterday's lottery <laughs> results comes up with a number and then it looks in the table there and it doesn't know whether this is really for this branch or not it doesn't store tag right. bits because it's like well i if it isn't what am i going to do i might as well come up with a guess right um and then so you know you think well if it doesn't know the branch has been in the table before or not that it's actually for this branch then how can it predict forward or backwards because either it's too late because it's already run through the pipeline they might as well carry on or it's got a prediction and the prediction it doesn't know if it's for this branch anyway. So, so I wrote a whole bunch of stuff about this, and um, I had access to a, like a really a, my, a weird server machine I had in my basement, still in my basement, in fact, still my main server. Uh, and so I ran all these experiments, and it found some really interesting patterns in the way that it um, the branch target buffer, which is I think a thing that one doesn't think about with branch prediction. I certainly when I talk to to, to folks like in an interview setting, we talk about mm-hmm. branch prediction. And it's always, is the branch taken or not, right? That's right. what most people think of. But like, it's like, is there a branch there at all is the question you need to ask before you even start fetching. Because like I right. said, it'd be five cycles on. You've like finally decoded the world and you've gone, oh, there's a branch here. And you're like, well, too late. The train's already gone down that route <laughs> ahead of right. you. So you have to kind of predict if there's a branch there at all. And then where the heck it's going to, because decoding the destination is half of the, the trouble. So, and obviously a lot of branches are not conditional. They are jumps or they're calls or they're rets or whatever. And so trying to make that prediction happen early is what the branch target buffer is doing. And then secondly, if and only if it's conditional, is it taken or not, right? Right, (laughs) But we always think about the conditional or not conditional thing. So um, anyway, I was doing this whole bunch of analysis on the branch target buffer. And so, yeah, when the the paper for Meltdown and Spectre came out, I... I got a little footnote in the 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 as a, as a citation saying like this is how some of the ways that you can predict where the branches mm. are going to go or what or not and I was like wow this is my first like proper security <laughs> paper right. thing that cites me I mean it's literally like the, the bottom of the list of things but you know it was cool I yeah I, that's awesome I, I think 